I think about not working in my office full time. I think about um, having time to do more things that I've dabbled in that I would like to do more of. Um, I think about being more self-indulgent. I've been very disciplined for a long time. And um, at living life at, at a different pace. My expectation is in retirement, I want to be useful. I want to get out there and just to be able to, to do something, feel I'm contributing something. I don't want to sit around and, and kind of vegetate. I just don't want to do that to do the things that I want to do now that family is raised and that uh, my career with my present employer is winding down. So I'd like to be able to do many things and uh, consider it a second career. Americans today have high expectations for life after retirement. That word no longer conjures up images of rocking chairs and shuffleboard. Today's retirees see themselves on the verge of a new career, a new way of life characterized by an active lifestyle. And with each successive generation, expectations about retirement seem to grow. In fact, since retirement first became a reality, less than 100 years ago, it has been constantly evolving. The history of retirement is a history of change. How has this history shaped our expectations for retirement? How has it made them possible? And what does retirement mean today in the 1990s? Back in the 19th century, there was really no such thing as retirement simply because almost no one retired. The model American family was an extended one, living on a family farm. When grandma and grandpa got too old for hard physical labor, they didn't stop working. They moved from the fields into the home and helped around the house. People worked together, lived together, and took care of one another. Retirement really wasn't much of an issue because very few people, and we're talking here mostly about men because women were basically homemaker types, very few men lived long enough to retire. Uh, the average lifespan at the turn of the century was just something over uh, about 47 years. And uh, the average male spent something a little over a year in retirement. So that was such a minor part of his life that retirement really wasn't an issue. My father was a coal miner and uh... He died as a result of being in the mine with black lung. He was a big, strong man. He was six foot four, 240 pounds. He died when he was 44 years old. There was no money put aside for our future, nothing. A retirement's almost unheard of. But with the dawning of a new century came the birth of the Industrial Age. The good jobs were found not on farms, but in factories. America was being transformed. But with modern times came modern problems, especially for older Americans. In the late 19th century, several factors uh, began to change the uh, conditions under which older workers uh, worked uh, and began to change their, uh, their work lives. One was uh, increasing mechanization. The speed at which these machines had to be operated was a speed beyond which some older workers had difficulty. So this increased pressure on some employers to hire uh, younger persons. Technology and the speed at which technology is operated and these competitive conditions at the turn of the century, uh, the uh, produce conditions which make it reasonable to begin thinking about getting rid of older workers. Uh, we saw a tremendous shift both in our economic, political, and our social structure. Uh, we went really from a three-generation family to almost uh, one and a half, and as you know today, it's really a one-generation family. Uh, we went from an agrarian economy to really an industrialized economy where some people say uh, people did not do their own work, that they earned money in order to support themselves, uh, so we shifted. Uh, we became very mobile. Ford developed the car and people moved around a lot more. There was a lot less of a feeling of obligations to one's parents. But the shift toward a mobile and industrial society 
left many older Americans without jobs and without the traditional bonds of kin and community to support them. And due to advances in medicine, they were now living longer. The number of older citizens grew even greater as America became home to hundreds of thousands of elderly immigrants. As their ranks continued to grow, widespread poverty among older Americans became a serious problem, a problem that was being ignored. America was in the midst of a period of unprecedented prosperity. It was called the Roaring Twenties. It was a time of easy money and bathtub gin, and the youth culture of the jazz age all but ignored the plight of America's elderly. In 1927, a prominent lawyer observed, quote, practically all of the other advanced nations of the world have adopted some modern measure to relieve the suffering of the aged poor. The United States, now the richest nation, stands alone in doing nothing. Suddenly, America's carefree years ended. Banks closed their doors. Industry came to a standstill. 15 million Americans, young and old, were now without jobs and without savings. Unemployment and poverty were suddenly everyone's business. I'm your pal, buddy, can you spare a dime? I can still remember it vividly because of the effect on my parents. The sense of hopelessness, of, of hope lost, in the sense that even though you worked hard through your life and you were honest and upright and thrifty and all these good things, suddenly something could come along and happen in the country at large, which made your efforts worthless. The Depression hit older Americans especially hard. Most had their life savings wiped out. What few jobs there were went to the young. In cities like Detroit, Michigan, they were running 45% unemployment. And that created a tremendous political pressure uh, to do something. In the face of a growing national despair, Franklin Delano Roosevelt promised a new deal for the American people and was elected president in 1932. At his inauguration, he promised an administration that would remember the forgotten man and embark upon a program of bold and persistent experimentation. This nation is asking for action, and action now. Action came quickly. Within days, Roosevelt's administration began to push a flood of New Deal legislation through Congress, providing for widespread public aid. One of the most controversial proposals was the Social Security Act, and contained within it was a small section called Old Age Insurance. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, they had a public assistance program which provided for old age assistance, uh, aid to the blind, aid to families with dependent children. There was a rehabilitation program. There was a program for public health. Uh, old age insurance was, was the last title and was thought really to be a very unimportant part of the program. And it's turned out to be the, uh, the single largest insurance program in the country. When Roosevelt in 33 came out with the Social Security, we all said, uh, what the hell is this? Uh, they're taking 30 cents, 37 cents out of our paycheck. We were all screaming about this. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was almost unbelievable, you know. When Ida Fuller of Ludlow, Vermont, received the very first Social Security check, people soon became believers. She had paid only $100 into the system and was to eventually get $21,000 back. Social Security was indeed revolutionary. Although many complained that it wasn't enough, Social Security profoundly changed America's ideas about growing old. Never again would retirement be synonymous with poverty. 
President Hoover promised uh, a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot, but it never materialized until Roosevelt came along. He had our hearts and our soul because he tried to help us. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, with the massive industrial buildup required to fight World War II, unemployment virtually disappeared, and concerns about the welfare of the elderly were forgotten as the nation focused its full attention on the war effort. In every hand, whatever they try, we've got to reply in language that they understand. Arms for the love of America and for the love of every mother's son. The war was over, the depression of bitter memory, and people were ready to settle down to the best of what America had to offer. Years of sacrifice had created high expectations for life in post-war America. As revolutionary as Social Security once seemed, now just providing a safety net for people too old to work didn't seem to be enough. Social Security had really bumped its head against the ceiling. And it's still bumping its head against the ceiling. It really limits to what you can do with Social Security. After all, most people are paying as much or more in Social Security taxes as they are in income taxes to produce this not terribly significant income level. It's really a poverty income level. If you're going to live in dignity in retirement, you are not going to ever do it on Social Security. You're either going to do it on private pensions plus Social Security plus your savings, or you're just not going to do it. Since the government's pension plan, Social Security, wasn't enough, workers began to look towards their employers to provide for their retirement through private pension plans. Private pensions were nothing new. The first one in America was established by the American Express Company back in 1875 and the railroads began providing them a short time later. For decades, private pensions were relatively rare, but after World War II, the number of private pension plans grew dramatically. Organized labor's concern for the financial security of retiring workers had led them to push for more and more pension coverage. But it didn't take long for some employers to begin to see the value of a pension plan. As the idea of private pension plans caught on, uh, employers established them for various reasons. One, it enabled them to have some influence over the turnover of their workforce. They could try to provide incentives for people to work longer or people to retire early as they needed to based upon economic conditions, etc. Uh, they also had more of a need to provide private pensions in order to stay competitive with others in their industry or in order to be able to attract and retain and motivate their workforce. Uh, the feeling clearly exists in the late 1940s that, uh, that the labor market uh, is something that has to be uh, managed and superintended in a new way. And to do this, one of the ways in which this is done is that workers, older workers, have to be encouraged to leave the workplace. The workplace then becomes a place where younger workers uh, have a priority. Retirement was becoming a fact of American life. An individual's option to keep on working was being closed off. In the 1950s, after this, uh, this, the, the rapid growth of pension plans in the late 1940s, uh, there's increasing concern about retirement because more and more workers realize that they are going to be separated from the workplace and they're going to have to spend uh, 10, 15, or 20 years of their lives outside of a work environment. So there's increasing debate and concern uh, in the 1950s about this new thing that's developing, this new lump of leisure called retirement. Uh, in response to this uh, concern, insurance companies and other institutions begin to market the idea, a kind of modern idea of retirement. They give, begin to see.
thing that happens in the 1950s is the, uh, the proliferation of journals uh, about retirement. Uh, Senior Citizen, uh, the magazine is founded in 1955, and Modern Maturity is founded in 1959. And most of these journals present the new concept of retirement. Uh, to their readers. They encourage readers to, uh, to think about retirement that something that, uh, as something that's very positive, to prepare for it enough so it, so it presumably will be positive. Uh, they've really given up on the world of work as an option for people over 65 or over 70. Americans embrace the new image of the golden years. Private pension plans were growing at an incredible rate, and millions of retirees were coming to depend on them. But to say that they grew after World War II is not to say that they were secure after World War II, because until 1974, this promise, I'll give you a pension when you retire, could be made lawfully as a completely breakable promise. You could make it, and then you could walk away from it, and you weren't liable for anything. But they were hollow promises promise you 50% of salary when you retire, but if we don't have the money in the fund or the company goes bankrupt, uh, or for whatever reason they decide to terminate the plan, uh, the employee got nothing. In 1964, one event focused national attention on the tragedy of those broken promises. There was a car named the Studebaker. There's a revelation in car performance waiting for you. So drive the new Studebaker for the motoring thrill of your life. To own the new Studebaker is to also experience new comfort. And the Studebaker car was made in South Bend. And Studebaker just stopped making it, or at least they stopped making it in the United States. They didn't go broke, they didn't go bankrupt, they just stopped making the Studebaker. In those days, if you went to South Bend, this is what you saw. You saw a nice little town, and it had basically three things in it. It had Studebaker, it had Bendix, and it had Notre Dame. And when Studebaker shut down, it was an economic catastrophe for South Bend. And unfortunately, what happened is when Studebaker Packard went out of business, uh, it liquidated. Uh, the pension plan assets were not set aside in a separate trust fund, and there were not minimum requirements to assure that the corporation was setting aside an adequate enough money in order to pay people their pension promises. So as a result, when Studebaker Packard went under, individuals only got a few cents on every dollar of pension benefits that they had expected to receive. Included in the unemployed were some 3,000 people over 50 years of age who had about 2,000 dependents under 19 years old. Most of them had no source of income except... And what we discovered was that the interesting thing about people who are old who have been done dirt is that they're all alone. They're isolated out there and they know there's something wrong. They, they counted on this and it didn't come and they don't know why, they don't know who to complain to. And Studebaker, my client at the time, didn't do anything unlawful. It simply hadn't made a recourse promise. It hadn't made a promise that it had to keep. It settled for a little money, and there was a political explosion. Frank Cummings went from being a lawyer defending Studebaker to working for Senator Jacob Javits on Capitol Hill, lobbying for regulation of private pension plans. In Senate hearings, thousands of retirees revealed the hardships they had experienced. But the debate dragged on for over a decade. A complicated compromise between labor and business was finally signed into law on Labor Day 1974. The new bill was dubbed the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA for short. This massive collection of rules and regulations safeguarded private pension plans, forcing employers to stand by their promises. This legislation will alleviate the fears and the anxiety of people who are uh, on the production lines or in the mines or elsewhere in that they now know that their 
investment in private pension funds will be better protected. They have a vested right. They're certain, obviously, of better management of those funds. Uh, it certainly will give to those 30 plus million American workers a greater degree of certainty as they face retirement in the future. Before ERISA was passed, a vast majority of all pension plans in the country did not have enough assets to pay their promised benefits. In fact, less than 40% did in 1975. Today, over 80% of all pension plans have more than enough money to pay all the benefits that they had promised, and a number of them are significantly overfunded, if you will. So just on that one measure alone, uh, there has been a great degree of increase in the security that people have with regard to their pension promises. Though ERISA has been successful at ensuring previously existing plans in American business, this enormously complicated set of laws did nothing to ensure the establishment of new retirement benefits by companies that formerly had none. In fact, since the passage of ERISA, 50,000 old plans have been dropped. And the average employer looks at this monster and says, hey, I don't need pension plans anymore. I'm perfectly prepared to be liable. I'm perfectly pre prepared to disclose. I'm prepared to put away a reasonable amount of money. But I'm not prepared to live in a straitjacket in order to accommodate a, a wacky law. Employers I see these days are looking at the complexity and the monstrous pile of laws on top of defined benefit plans, the true pension plan, and saying who needs it, and they're going over to profit sharing or individual account plans where the employee takes all the risk. Today's retiring worker is confronted with a mind-boggling array of retirement plans and options. Defined benefit, variable annuity, IRAs, KEOs, 401ks, Social Security. Confronting these choices requires a great deal of responsibility because complicated decisions that used to be made by the government or the employer must now be made by the individual. The complex nature of retirement today requires Americans to start thinking about retirement earlier and earlier. The economy being what it is today, um, everyone's trying to make it through the day, through the week, through the next month, and not thinking about 25 years from now. If you ask me the question whether or not I feel my generation is really trying to take care of themselves for the future, I don't get a sense of that. But I do get a sense that we're going to live longer. Uh, I'm very fond of telling people that I speak to that pensions are for the young. Because if you don't earn them when you're young, it's too late to earn them when you're old. The trouble with the average youngster is that the average youngster truly believe that they will never get to be 30. Um, much less 60 or 65. They believe that youth springs eternal. And then some, one day you wake up and you say, hey, I'm 58 and I don't have a pension. I think I better start earning it. Too late. No plan is going to let you earn a significant pension from 58 to 62 or 65. You're going to earn it when you're young. People begin to think about the future when they have children. Um, Somehow or other, having children makes your head turn to how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that and how am I going to do the other thing. When you have children, you have to begin looking at your situation as a corporation. And you plot and plan as a corporation would. Uh, you look at the day-to-day -day operation. You have to worry about cash flow, money to buy groceries this week. And as a father, you realize that you're dealing with future. So you necessarily need to think of retirement years. So there's a logical progression. And I think that, along with the natural aging process, um, just you, you think about it because you're ready to think about it. And even people like my husband who don't think about retiring think about not thinking about retirement. Okay, so I don't think anybody doesn't think about it. I think some of us make a conscious decision 
to not think about thinking about it. Uh, but I think people have to be sort of deaf, dumb, and blind to not know that all around them people are retiring. As America enters the 1990s, a great many retiring workers are, in a sense, back where they started in the 1890s, taking care of themselves, with an obvious difference, the pension system. Today, every American, whether working or retired, has to take an active role in confronting complex financial issues if the dream of the golden years is to become something more than just a dream. And so retiring has to do with time, which is a very precious commodity, to do, to do the stuff that you would like to do more of if you weren't working all the time. And in order to do that, um, until another system comes along, if you want to live that way, you, you have a personal responsibility to yourself to find a way to provide the money to do that. Nobody's, I mean, I, nobody's going to do that for you. 